Hello, and welcome to Resolve, an afterplay show. This is an after show for a role-playing game that does not have an actual play, where we tell you all the details of our game, so you'll have to listen to it. Hi, I'm Sammy, I'll be your host, my pronouns are she, her, and I play Assyria Moli, the Hope of the Abyss. Joining me is my wonderful co-host, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex, I play the Malboro Juice and his mule companions, the Smogs. All of us use he, him pronouns. We are joined today by D. Hello, I'm back again. You can use whatever pronouns for me as long as they're not it. And I play Geyser. She is, again, a problems clown. It seems like I'm going full circle the wrong way. Geyser uses she, her pronouns. We are also joined today by Daniel. Hi, my name's Daniel. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the game master for this campaign. Welcome! Thank you for joining us today. Now that we're all here, Alex, why don't you tell us about the actual play? Previously, in a feat, Hound 5 interprets data from Tara's memory as audio logs that he plays for Pony and Tao. They display Tara talking about her world travel experience to an unbelieving audience and a voice debating with itself about world travel. The series sees a vision of Elder Musa and her dream, but her face is obscured and static. Syria wakes to find her procedure over and quickly shuttles the group back to Sequence Charter. Geyser trains with the pilots on Sequence Charter and aids in the Mermaid Exus project, while Smog studies Juice's world core with Aura. Smog, Juice, and Geyser dash to the world of spirit when they hear about a governance attack. They find Ruth, Jilly's mother, face covered in static, gloating about Susie and Valentine's disappearance, and kill her. They learn that Susie and Teddy's world cores were removed and they were kidnapped. Before entering the configuration, World Core, Terra, the Marauders, Aura, and Powder discuss plans and findings. World Core, with Aura and Powder, ride the Lemma into the configuration and during the eclipse behind Chrysalis forces. They find the Marauders in combat with Alpha and her governance forces and aid them in the fight. Despite a series of efforts, Geyser lands a killing blow on Alpha. The governance retreats. World Core enters a portal on the island the governance was defending. Aura finds World Core signatures from it, and Tau can feel Terra beyond it. They are presented with an arcade of white machines and told they are free to return home by the same voice that announces World Step. Unhappy with this resolution and full of questions, Asiri pulls the party to Terra, and two glowing figures are reaching for each other in a gray arcade. These figures explain they are responsible for the false, staticky governance and the circumstances leading to World Core entering Sequence Charter. After much questioning, they are presented with two basic premises, one from each figure, allow these forces to exist in the world and be able to travel between worlds, or close this method of travel and be forced to attempt new types of travel in the future. Terra, hungry to find her ancestral home, Earth, argues for traveling immediately. After much deliberation and a threat to these forces if they meddle again, World Corps decides to allow world travel through these entities' creation. Now that you've heard the actual play, let's do a deep dive into the session. So much happening. Oh, we made it, kids. It's the end, and I'm gonna cry. Sag. <laughs> it escalated real fast, and it stayed escalated. <laughs> like, foot to the, the fucking floor. Like, there, somebody cut the brakes. It was a finale, and as I was anticipating, it was a tense one. <laughs> it's so hard playing as the anachronism and trying to build scaffolding around a future and then realizing like there's a really compelling option that blows up everything I set up. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that just the way, huh? Sometimes people throw a wrench in your plans. Though the thing is, I don't think we went down the path that blows up everything I was thinking of, which is wild, because it seemed like it really could have gone any which way. The best place to start is at the beginning, so we enter with Tau and Pony going through Terra's memories still on the sister planet, and Hound walks and is like, oh, would you like me to translate part of this code into a vocal array so you can hear it? And you hear Terra talking about the world travel plans in her voice and her memories. The voice cuts in for our psycho pop introduce the world's voice, and it's two voices arguing about how things should or should not be connected. The voice Tara had in these clips was her younger self back around the time of the previous campaign that Sammy, you and I and uh, were a part of. And and D actually. It was actually very fitting. <laughs> and I ran. I will remind people like <laughs> <laughs> The gang's all here. You oversaw the progression of that storyline, at least from the initial 
settings. What we were hearing was information that was transferred at that original setting back into the simulation. I wanted to provide a little bit more clarity as far as what could be going on. The session beforehand, we had quite a lot of Tao's delving into the data, and there was a lot there. I wanted to spell things out a little bit more clearly, if possible. It makes me very glad I didn't get rid of absolutely everything about the old game and editing, and it came up a couple times. Hopefully, people are aware with some of the concepts we've been talking about from the first game, because they are more important in this finale than they have been. This is where the continuity between the previous campaign that we were a part of and this game is most apparent. This competition between the other and another, it had continued past the point where Terra had left. That is manifesting itself here. It's so funny because these exact figures didn't exist until that crossover, and then they became really important in all the rest of the games. I don't think they figured very much into the end game for your game at least as we were playing it. But I think the other group that did the crossover did, and I definitely included it in Zach's game a lot. I wanted to keep as many things as possible true to what had been established, but critically is the fact that their existence is tied to the act of crossing over. Since that was one of the origination points, it would have been very appropriate if their existence into a different reality was also mandated by a similar act of crossing over. And that's at least what another was looking for. There's a lot we could say, but I think I want to wait until the yeah. end. I think it's important to, to hone in on that concept of creation here. That's There's a reason I left that as the last word of the actual play. There was something going on with the Siri at the same time. So the Siri is finishing her barnacle surgery. The sounds of everything going around her sort of fade away. And she enters this dreamlike state of She's back in the depths of the ocean. She's back in her home waters. She comes across the bioluminescence of her teacher, Elder Musa. Their face is just like completely obscured by a cloud of static. And in front of her is the empty diving suit that uh, a series saw earlier before she woke up as the Abyss. And then the helmet is removed and there's all sorts of coral and stuff growing out of it. And Elder Musa is in their own traditional cryptic fashion. is just like, oh good, you finally know what you are. I'm here to tell you that this place is not the same without you. That the Abyss is gone from us. The rest of us is without purpose, without any meaning now that you're gone. And it was chilling and scary and the series did not <laughs> like it. <laughs> There's a conflict as the Abyss. Is Siri supposed to be at least a very omnipresent being, but in an incarnate form is a lot more limited? Yeah, and I kind of put in my own limitation because I knew that playing any sort of celestial or godly being, that's always a factor. It's like, oh, I could just use my bullshit god powers to solve this problem immediately. The existence of the configuration and the incomplete little cavitation bubble that we're all trapped in prevented the abyss from connecting back fully with itself so they couldn't really see beyond the bounds of the solar system that chrysalis is in they couldn't really reach beyond into other worlds to feel those things where the abyss should be present so it was both fun and frustrating as a player or at least for a siri to be like i should know these things but now I don't, because I can't reach out and feel them the way I, I'm supposed to. It forced me to make some interesting decisions. When anyone mentions that they have godly powers, it makes me <laughs> buckle up, too. <laughs> there were a lot of lofty concepts together at once. Trying to push those moments that were more grounded was a bit of a challenge. When that was successful, it was a lot more satisfying. Because we have Isiri and Smog in a way Tao. <laughs> crazy bonkers powers and then you have the like npcs that are around like all around that's a lot to wrangle which is why i always try to put in limitations to what a particular being can do in any system even if i'm jamming i'm like there is a rock that god cannot lift you know <laughs> god can be attacked and dethroned exactly I do not play a god character at all, and I've essentially been playing like Geyser can do whatever the fuck she wants. Geyser's natural limitation is her own imagination, 
So guys, there's not thinking about the limits of time and how to interrupt people's destiny or, or all that stuff. From like a conceptual level, Geyser is an imaginary friend. The limit is imagination. There's no limit there, like conceptually. Yeah. So you you may as well be playing a god if if Geyser can dream and it can become. That's a line that Smog has been trying to show Geyser for a very long time. Like, what is the difference between an imaginary friend and a deity? Geyser, the character, would not <laughs> pick up on that very well. <laughs> we did have the moment in the world of motion. It landed to Geyser as a, like, pep talk. It's not like, I am so powerful. Geyser has narrow perspective on things. Going back to a series vision, Musa, like, I know that you're of Awakened as the Abyss. I know it's been, like, literally milliseconds on the cosmic clock that the Abyss yeah. operates under. But you need to get a move on on getting back home. Which, we later find out, is just the influence of another. I still think... It is an appropriate kick in the fin that a Siri would need at this point in time. Despite being a manifestation of hope, a Siri can get stuck in her head a little bit about the mechanics of things. Just having somebody she trusts be like, you can do it, you just need to work faster on it, was important for her here. Was there anything at the time that ticked you off to what might have been going on exactly in that moment? Obviously, the pressure here is, come back to us, we need you, we miss you, I want you to come back, because the Abyss being back will fix our problems. And that's very good impetus for Siri to do what she was going to do anyways. Because of the static face, the obscurity that this is perhaps not truly the person that you know and trust, the Abyss's shell is sitting in front of us as the diving suit rotting on the ocean floor here. The metaphor is not lost to me that things are rotten in the woods here. <laughs> I wanted to place down at least seeds, if not even hints, that instead of something just being in the series' mind, that she was instead looking into the configurationist. Because that's where that dive suit was located, where a version of Elder Musa could be found. But the arrival of this is at least a little bit more unexpected, I suppose, because Asiri physically did not travel anywhere. It was more something that they looked into. The Abyss does look back sometimes, so it's not without reason. Asiri comes back to the surgery is completed. Powder is right there holding her hand, making sure she's okay. Asiri's like, we need to get back. Problems are bad and we need to solve them. But meanwhile, like, Tao is sifting through Asiri's own brain data and finds similar defects to what they found in Terra's memories. They also found some maps that looked a lot more similar to what was found in Terra's mindscape. Also, no location data for Musa in the vision. That's another problem. <laughs> makes sense if you, if you don't want to worry about location. Just null it out. Yeah. When y'all had looked through Terra's memories, there were instances of Terra speaking that also had a similar issue. Null instance information. It was supposed to parallel whatever was messing with Terra's memories, or at least that data, also did the same thing to Asiri while Asiri was undergoing this process. Rude. Very rude. Very rude. The fact that something would use someone that Asiri trusts <laughs> in order to do this. Tao also sends Terra the information they located in an email so that they're prepared to talk about it later. <laughs> Tao's always so helpful about <laughs> doing that. They never make a meeting. It's always an email. Well, meanwhile, Geyser and Smog have been hanging out on Sequence Charter. Geyser is still kind of reeling after Sierra's loss and has decided to go, you know, full gung-ho on all of the science while everyone's collecting the data and doing surgery on a Siri, guys are like, I'm gonna go underwater and do stuff. <laughs> How about the marine biologist? I wanted to play with something with smog that Dan and I had talked about a while ago. Like, why does juice still have to be there? And we talked about maybe smog no longer having his world core and relying on juice to get back home. I don't know if we played that off in the end, but what I did here still worked into the larger narrative anyway, so I'm very happy to have done it. There ended up being a lot of testing with Aura. How do we locate that somebody has a world core? Can we use being in transit as a way of figuring that out? 
I hadn't fully thought about what would make Smog in particular lose their world core, besides maybe obviously the, pol- the process of becoming the connected. But even at the very beginning, Smog and Juice were amalgamated with each other. Smog and Juice are effectively one one core instance, and if it needs to be rooted in Juice, then that's that's how it has to be. Because Smog obviously is a lot more malleable in terms of their existential state. Yeah. <laughs> than Juice is. Or is the most grounded person in this entire campaign, besides maybe Father Shade? <laughs> <laughs> and like or it's like yeah i'll solve this problem but we need to do some stuff to figure it out and i like how that manifests in sending juice through the world of assembly portal with a bunch of just like sensors stapled to them for or at least but like all of the other human researchers anything related to world travel is inherently experimental something that i wanted to keep as a running theme through this campaign is that they don't have it all figured out not like Aura is like, oh yeah, I have this device that's just perfect for doing so. It's, oh, I need to reverse engineer this, or we need to innovate on this concept, which will take some time at least to have a chance at doing these things, because we really are shooting in the dark. No one exactly wrote the book on how to cross between dimensions. It's funny that that is what ends up being useful, because Smog's motivations here are I know I don't have my world core. I know Juice needs to participate in the ending here. I cannot remember exactly how the ending is supposed to go because my memory has been fucked with. Does Juice need to participate in this or can Juice go back now? And his determination was, well, if Juice is still showing signs of having the world core, it hasn't gone in to complete what we need to do. Juice needs to stick around. It turned out to be pretty useful. You ended up using the results of this research to guide your exploration later on. Yeah, Aura MVP. God, Aura. Didn't always trust you, Aura, but you pulled through in the end. <laughs> I don't think Smog ever had a contentious relationship with Aura, but that makes sense given Smog and Aura, I think. The only thing that Aura didn't quite understand was Smog's time weirdness. They were a little concerned about there was the possibility of a time validator. We're already working with forces that we don't fully comprehend, but now we got more of <laughs> In the middle of all of this fun, Smog and Geyser and Juice hear about an attack happening in the world of spirit and rush to aid. I knew it was coming, but it didn't mean I could be happy about it. Obviously, Willow is the next one to target. They're the least defended out of everyone. They don't deserve it. They just <laughs> need to... They, they were just vibing out, having their adult parties. <laughs> Here comes the fucking governance. <laughs> Geyser drops everything reasonable because Geyser is very dead set on not leaving any trace of the existence of the governance. They gotta go. That's how Geyser feels and has felt for at least a month in game time. Another consequence of the fact that you at least had the um, communicators between the worlds that you could know that this was happening in the first place. Or reverse engineered once again, or MVP. Or MVP. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or reverse engineered that f- from the harvestman that Tau, Assyria, and I destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but you guys salvaged that harvestman so that guys are going to use it later. If I learned anything from powder, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. So <laughs> That's you know. the theme of this game. <laughs> <laughs> Recycle your weapons. <laughs> it's really interesting thinking back on it, how much effort everyone has put into trying to make life on Sequence Charter and increase Solace better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes the ending of this hurt that much more, but I don't want to jump the gun. <laughs> it will contribute to our epilogues a lot. Yeah, especially I agree. the plans that you have. Yes. Everyone found a part of the world that they integrated with themselves they they found a place in this dimension that they had been abducted to (laughs) effectively it makes that attachment a lot more pronounced the line smog said at the very beginning it's like what if i don't want to go back (laughs) yeah (laughs) ominously accurate (laughs) i think that'll play pretty heavily into smog's ending (laughs) we get there and it's immediately balls to the wall 
there's already shit happening and I get there and it's that bitch Ruth. <laughs> I've only made one playbook change, but it seems like I'm using all of <laughs> my moves. I really had expected me to try and dialogue with Ruth for like the benefit of the party but then it was like game time and i was like murder time <laughs> geyser reaches back to her unevolved self and summons a chainsaw and hacks her arm off i'm using the dice bot again and you know the dice bot loves it loves it absolutely loves it when i do violence loves violence it was immediate anger immediate violence i am not here to play with this bitch i have talked about geyser's backstory on here before so i won't go into too much detail but ruth is jilly's mother jilly is the girl that created geyser for many reasons, Geyser does not like Ruth, and Geyser has tried to attack Ruth before, successfully, before the events of the campaign. Smog and Juice help out. It's time to use our ultimate form and do some transformations. Smog hops into Alexander mode to try to do some recon, does not trust Ruth to give us accurate information about what happened, and sees Teddy and Susie losing their world cores and getting abducted in his eyes while juice becomes a mist dragon and just fucking suffocates ruth <laughs> yeah. i was thinking shit i was definitely expecting that there would be more of a conversation i was not mentally prepared for oh yeah they're just gonna tag team in two shot <laughs> <laughs> this character if Ruth had just, like, appeared somewhere, maybe. But because it was specifically post-attack on Willow, post-something being done to Susie and Teddy, who we worked very hard to preserve. In that moment, Geyser was like, oh no, Susie's gone. Oh no, Jilly's gone. Ruth's at fault. I need to solve this. Not only that, but Ruth was wearing governance armor. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> You did this glorious toying with my mind, because this is a, yeah. a figure that's important from Geyser's past. It is wearing governance armor. I was yeah. like, for sure she's got an expanded harm clock. She's not a mook with four. Uh, and then, bam, <laughs> on the ground. Because no, she's just a pawn. <laughs> well, here's yeah. the thing. Most mooks only have two. Or one even in their arm clock. Four is actually expanded. <laughs> it was a back-to-back -back deal great heart. I might have been able to do something like treat them like a small gang, allow them to endure something like that. Ruth, in the midst of this like fighting, is like, it's too late, you can attack me, but haha, <laughs> I took your child's. And the guys are like, fuck you, you <laughs> stupid bitch. <laughs> And it was really fun to be as smog like. I mean, I'm a fucking time god. I'm never late to anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hilarious. Both of you were great with how you handled that, especially like for smog. We can kill you because I'll rewind the clock a little bit and see what the hell happened previously. We don't need you to exist. <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't exist any longer. Eradicated. This is what some of the other people that you've talked to before were describing when they witnessed these abductions, when that one regular governance soldier was brought back from the world of assembly, talking about how they saw someone who they thought was a governance soldier, but had static across their face and how people had just seemingly out of date or <laughs> impossible codes for their designations. This also leads to a delicious moment of tension between Smog and Geyser, because Smog is like, these people have been abducted as well. We can't just kill them on sight. <laughs> Susie and Teddy are among these people right now. Again, I'm in angry mode. <laughs> we are doing every violence. Smog was like, I trusted you about Ruth, but we don't know what's going on with the rest of the people. And the guys are just like, they have Susie! I'm going to kill them! And so it's like, Susie is them right now. Like, you cannot God. kill Susie. If you kill Susie, bad things will happen. We also can't kill someone else's Susie. Yeah. Like, that, yeah. Could, that could be an issue here. 
part of me really wanted to just go off. It would have been thematically appropriate for the moment, but I think the better play, in my opinion, was to just like begrudgingly accept Smog's logic. Geyser has two brain cells now, like there's some neurons firing. (laughs) Because this was immediately following you gaining clarity from reaching out to your emoji friend, shit. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Oh my god, that's we forgot to talk about the whole other half about the fantastic like, play here. So I took Girl Friday, which you have a secretary or assistant back on your home world. Not going to get too deep into the minutia of Geyser's backstory, but Geyser's not the only imaginary friend from her home world. The poop emoji shit is one of those imaginary friends. Shit is like in my world, canonically, like, the nice one. (laughs) And so it makes sense that of all the people, if she's not reaching out to the director of the home, she's reaching out to shit. Guys are using, like, the inter-world communicator is, like, reaching out. (sighs) Ruth was here. What's going on? What do you know? Give me the deets. Geyser learns that Ruth is not from the real governance. And... Susie and Teddy are in the configuration. Geyser turns to Smog and is explaining some of this to Smog and is like simultaneously bubbling with rage. Like, how dare you take my precious child? Both of them. (laughs) If Geyser in this moment could kill Ruth again, (laughs) she absolutely would have. It's also funny guys are being concerned, like, oh, you might not know what's going on because this is the first time I did this. And Smog is like, I mean, I know what's going on with you. <laughs> I've known you for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did. I was like, oh, so Smog knows Geyser's backstory now. <laughs> Alex is like, yeah, I always did. I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I don't worry about it. <laughs> I love time travel shenanigans. Going back that shows why Smog and Geyser had that conversation in the world of motion and movements like that. Smog has always known ways in which the party would progress and would not explicitly state it, but was not shy about pushing them a little bit. We have this like kind of tense conversation where Smog is like, okay, this murder is on the house, but the next one, be careful. (laughs) And Geyser's like, all murder is on the table. (laughs) This never actually pays off because we don't square off against the fake governance again, but I was totally expecting like, oh shit, we have to keep Geyser from killing a bunch of kidnappings. (laughs) It's funny she mentioned that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, But that, that was... A possibility. It was a very, <laughs> very close possibility. D, you gave me a pretty much a blank check if I wanted to throw Ruth in somehow, even as someone in the governance. And I was like, oh, perfect. I'm going to be messing around with people from their original worlds in something that is, but also isn't the governance. And then on top of that, to have the parallel being Ruth, this horribly abusive mother is also the person responsible for Susie's capture, is just kind of like a knife to the chest. Geyser was immediately, like, smitten with Susie, and there's not a lot of interaction between Geyser and Susie, but the interactions that are there is, like, Geyser going out of her way to be nice to Susie. Geyser's like, this is my child. I love her very (laughs) much. And then Susie's like, oh, a Siri. (laughs) She's also caretaking the last remnant of the world of the lost. That yeah. was like a world that was supposed to speak yeah. to Geyser. So yeah, there's a lot of connection there. It's literally a child, someone's daughter, accompanied by an imaginary friend of sorts. It's a little hard to not empathize <laughs> with that. Yeah. Lesson of the day. Do not kidnap children and use them to connect worlds. Geyser will kill you. (laughs) Good to know. That that goes against all my plans, but I'll keep that in mind. (laughs) The Lemma returns back to Chrysalis the day before the invasion, and we're having a final briefing meeting with Terra, the Marauders, everyone else involved. Because you all have been asking for it. This was my (laughs) attempt to first not only bring in but introduce the 
rest of the marauders that accompanied Terra, now that they're all not in their separate zones, and there's actually a moment to talk. <laughs> go, go, Power Rangers. They're Power Rangers. They're My favorite locals. Sentai squad. Featherman R. Featherman R, let's go. <laughs> I based them, mainly their names slash aesthetics, off of different Earths. Every one of the Marauders is like, essentially a different aspect and Terra's unintentionally initially unintentionally but now intentionally is supposed to be the center of all of that and i remember pointing that out to you like a million years ago and you were like no that's not what i meant but now we're like oh yeah that is what you meant. well it's what i mean now <laughs> <laughs> they basically go over the battle plans mainly because tau very much wanted to be included geyser as well both of them were very ready to start killing government soldiers. This was also like a last chance to hash out any like beef or concerns <laughs> that party members had between that and what Terra was doing. Everyone was appraised of what they had found in the different worlds. Or I gave another presentation. <laughs> Good for them. This is very much tying things together. But instead of talking about planning, we can talk about the plan that we executed oh, no. on the day of the eclipse. There were some initial ideas for how this could go that would have involved a time skip of some kind. One thing that I was considering but ultimately decided against was once you had connected the core of the last world that this is what you would come back to. Basically the invasion already happening. Instead we had everyone together and prepared and using the ship that you had all salvaged together as a pretty major aid. And then inside the configuration, we see pretty much still Chrysalis, except our moon is intact. Yeah. This was something that wasn't brought from out of its subtext. But what we saw in the configuration here was comprised of settings and parallels to Terra's past. Starting with the latest version, which was the war between the United Forces of Humanity and the governance itself. That formed the initial battleground that you all entered on. I had set it up so that we could also do something that I had been asked <laughs> to include, which was the option for a ship battle. Um, you, had, you had a spaceship. <laughs> I, I've been asked to at least put in the, the instance of a ship battle. And lo and behold, what happened? <laughs> Like that. I hope I didn't ask for that because that's not what I wanted to do at all. It was at least Sammy had asked, and then maybe a few others while talking on the podcast. Maybe Carolyn had asked for that too, potentially. It was instantly avoided. <laughs> I cannot let harm befall Powder. I don't think a Siri will allow any direct harm to befall Powder. Despite her getting her brand new cool ship, despite her getting her new uniform and her placement as officer in training. So the plan was, instead of going gung-ho into enemy fire, why don't we use the uh, immaculate oceans around us and turn the ship into a whale so that we could just go right by unnoticed. <laughs> 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 so Assyria turns to Geyser and is like, can you do that weird clothing thing with the vessel? <laughs> I use costume change. <laughs> <laughs> to wrap a whale suit <laughs> around the ship. <laughs> As we get closer, or it does identify that there's a portal that seems to be in the middle of fight that we see ongoing. Smog is thinking like maybe we can just pour into that and bypass them and let the forces of Chrysalis fight the governance here. Yeah. And everybody does a round or they're talking to each other. And then I think D you had come back from needing to get up for a second and you were like Oh, there's a fight? I'm going in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am so mad at what happened. <laughs> I know we didn't really roll links at the end of this because it doesn't matter anymore. But I was like, I was like, I cannot end this game with dark links on every party member. <laughs> <laughs> it's murder time. <laughs> like Geyser is destroying the governance as she has promised. Everyone's trying to be civil and calm and sneaky and make great plans. And Geyser's like, I have a big killing machine in my pocket. I'm going to do the big killing. <laughs> and go. 
Geyser launches herself out of the airlock. (laughs) (laughs) And then unshrinks the harvestman that's in her pocket and just starts wreaking chaos on the battlefield. What's perfect about this is that we established earlier in the same session that Geyser had shrunken down that harvestman just for an instance like this to happen. (laughs) (laughs) It was something she'd prepared for. Now that Geyser's on the field, Pony's like, oh shit, I get to fight. (laughs) Pony (laughs) jumps the fuck out and starts taking names, and everyone obviously starts targeting Alpha because, of course. Yeah, Pony focuses on harassing Alpha specifically, like, I don't want any of your plans to go off. The Marauders were down there engaging with Alpha and the other governance forces. Terra was nowhere to be seen, presumably had gone through the portal already. But the Marauders themselves were being overwhelmed and probably would not last much longer (laughs) without y'all's intervention. A lot of this encounter was also changing the tide of the fight. And I I used either like a regular deep dive or a sleuth skill to get that information. Or I just straight up asked you, what is the state of the battlefield? But I think even that question came after I had jumped out of the (laughs) (laughs) ship. Geyser is not thinking about anything but utter destruction. Forget the fact that my friends are there and have plans. I see governance, weapons, uniforms, and all of that. It is time to go. Geyser, because of the training that she's been doing with Jet and the Harvestmen, is thinking strategically about war. but not really about the safety of the Marauders. I want to win this. (laughs) I'm going to cut them off from flanking the (laughs) Marauders. Everyone in the ship that's still in there, right? So everyone besides Pony just sees like a big old crab thing expand into real life and just start swinging arms everywhere and harpooning people and knocking people off the (laughs) island and (laughs) just... Everything happened fast, as it does in a fight scene, so, like, that doesn't shock me. But sitting there back on the ship, a series like, this doesn't concern me. I'm not a, a war-fighting creature. I'm a god. The actions of these mortals are not for me to interfere with in this case. And then, so she's, like, turning to the rest of the party. She's like, alright, how do we get to the portal? How do we get there? She's not surprised Tao joins in, because Tao already said that. The thing she's yeah. disappointed in is Smog. Because Smog and her had already had this conversation of, we should not be interfering on this level to some things. And Smog's just like, all right, time to fight. (laughs) Let's go. Yeah, Smog is like, if we're fighting, we're fighting. I know that all the rest of these people need to be alive with their fucking world cores to get through this. I'm not sacrificing them just because they're making a choice. I tried to present humanity in this game as very multivariate and diverse in terms of its sort of opinions towards things. I think it was very interesting to see what the individual player characters either engaged with or wholeheartedly rejected. Different people think different ways about the level of escalating conflict with the governance. Think about, you know, different various levels of regret <laughs> or um, rather justification. So it was very interesting to see where everyone fell at vis-a-vis participating in the conflict that he has. I also had a really good idea for a Final Fantasy summon. I (laughs) I mean, that's like the the minimum, like, decider for you. (laughs) Juice got a hold of some Psycho Glass in the sea and forged those into weapons and came out as Gilgamesh because I figured the configuration is a way between worlds and Gilgamesh is sometimes a summon, but also the Final Fantasy character who travels between worlds. It works. Oh, that's perfect. It's perfect. And then I got to do a fucking Muso Warriors game esque, like <laughs> smog trap people in holy light stasis, and then Legend of Zelda style stasis. Juice comes in and smacks them, and then the stasis comes off, and they fly out. It was, it was pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. It is too funny to pass up. <laughs> I think the one person who had that actual making a decision on where to fall in the conflict was Tao. Pony's just like, I get to be a hero. Geyser's like, I'm doing murder. (laughs) (laughs) Because I can't let these people fucking die. (laughs) (laughs) And Siri's like, mortal wars are not my domain. 
Siri just hates violence for the sake of violence. Like, if, if you're gonna kill something, eat it. Use it. Like, don't just slaughter it because you, you're mad at it. Like, that doesn't make any sense to her at all. I was thinking very, like, warrior style, these people would be knocked out because that's how, at least in the... I think in the not main series games, they don't count as kills because other brands don't want to talk about killing. They talk, they count as KOs. So I was thinking it in very warrior style. Like these people are just going to be knocked out for a bit. That's fair. Well, very interesting that Tau stayed back. We should talk about what Tau did though, because it's not completely nonviolent. Yeah. <laughs> Tau stayed back to run interference, cause a massive disruption in their forms of communication. Tau astutely remembered the government soldiers coordinate with the commanders, even to um, an intra-world extent. And so they're like, first thing I'm going to do is make sure that they can't do any of that. Tau also uses a light portal to summon the sleep beast after making <gasps> right. a grand introduction with the ship speakers that they might have magicked up. Who knows? <laughs> we get to like fulfill our deal that was a little short changed earlier, and now the Sleep Beast can feast on this world without limitations. <laughs> Good for them. At this point, of course, Alpha's like, four of those world travel fuckers just jumped out of this whale. <laughs> like, go get the whale. <laughs> and the series like, oh no, Powder's in this whale. I'm also in this whale, and Aura is too. Asiri is not gonna get involved. Asiri will defend herself, but she is not going to retaliate. She's like, alright, Powder, I'll be back, and jumps into the ocean, and I finally succumbed, and I took ultimate form. <laughs> Leviathan has risen again out of the water, spuns all these dark tentacles, the kraken appears, and wraps the whale up inside of it, and is just deflecting shots <laughs> this entire time. It was a pretty good parallel to um, the end of the first world that you all did, the ending of the world of spirit, where you have Tao and the Sleep Beast, where their relationship is has completely flipped. Whereas previously it was burn monster burn to I'm bringing you here to use your powers to to help us out. And then yeah, Aziri coming in for the means of protection for the humans and Tao still on board, making sure that they don't get blast it out of the sky by the governor's story. The government gets some good shots in, Pony gets some good shots in, the beast gets some shots in, mm -hmm. and Alpha takes a pot shot at Geyser's Harvestman's legs. Yeah. And this, of course, draws the ire out of Geyser. <laughs> <laughs> and Geyser takes a pot shot back. This pisses me off to, like, <sighs> no level. But, like, <laughs> the shot kills Alpha. Yeah. How did Alpha have a lower harm clock than Ruth? Alpha had already taken a decent chunk of damage at that time. And we specifically had this because of Tao's interference. Alpha had taken her helmet off of <laughs> her armor. Their face, their head was completely exposed <laughs> while this was going on. Smog is also able to target multiple people with his ultimate form because of his link move. So yeah. Alpha might have also been affected by getting slammed with the Holy Judgment. Literally, Geyser blasts her fucking head off. <laughs> First than that, because the Siri tries to stop it by grabbing Alpha with a tentacle, and yeah. Geyser pushes through it. I think we talked about it, like, maybe being restrained in the tentacle helped Geyser get that shot. I'm so pissed at that. But, like, <laughs> part of it is because, A, my interference didn't work because it never fucking works. The other part is... <laughs> Too much of a light goober. <laughs> and I can't express exactly why. It, it feels wrong for Alpha to die here. It, it feels hollow to me. Like, of course war is hollow, blah, 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 blah. But there needed to be one more conversation with Terra first. And we mm. didn't get it. There's two aspects of what you said that actually make it probably the almost the most fitting that it... I chose the title of feet for its roots in something that's empty, something that's no longer bearing life. And on top of that, this island that you all are fighting on, which we didn't address explicitly here, is the island that Alpha died on previously. 
during the actual war between humanity and the government. So the fact that Alpha dies here again, but this time at the hands of World War, seems kind of fitting to me in a way. It also works so well for what I've talked about with Smog hinted at through especially the other versions we've seen throughout The Connected. They're scattering and we have to hunt them down because they've lost their head. Mm -hmm. That's why Mm -hmm. Smog has gone back in time, needs to be vengeful and powerful because he's getting rid of the governance. For Geyser, it makes sense that she wants to cut this particular story short. Geyser holds Terra in the concept of esteem. Geyser doesn't have any like real emotional attachment to Terra. Yeah. So she's not like, this is a person of authority and you should like give them some deference. But it's not like Geyser wants to reason with Alpha or Geyser would have a reason to want Terra to be able to talk to Alpha again. Geyser knows that this person is responsible for either destroying the moon on chrysalis like the the real one not in the configuration or kidnapping all the other people to make new portals if Susie doesn't get to be here if jilly doesn't get to be in her home then you don't get to exist even <laughs> we also you know explicitly that it was alpha leading the attack on tau's world yeah not just attacking life but attacking art and expression the reasons that we find joy in life. What else do you have? <laughs> this is someone who is involved with the first cataclysmic lunar event on Chrysalis, but yeah, also the destruction of Tao's world as well. D, when you're kind of talking about it, it kind of just struck me that even more so than Pony or Tao, who also had his reasons for hating the government, guys are like alongside becoming a marine biologist, also kind of became a soldier in a way. (laughs) Thinking about all of the different ways that guys are engaged with the military aspect of it, it became a resentment towards the governance of a tactical mindset now to destroy them on site. I will learn from military officers about how to pilot a weapon of war in order to destroy the governance. The problem is that Alpha is just a cog herself. This changes nothing. Literally, we can go back at the end of the epilogue and find out that the governance just retaliated. I don't think you're going to do that because you're not a dick, but... (laughs) What Smog has been talking about is explicitly about that. I think that's what's going to happen. Like, Smog is talking about having to hunt down the governance. Well, good. He can hunt it down away from Chrysalis. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I feel like Geyser would go off world to hunt them down, too. <laughs> Siri is going to be planted at home and everyone else is going to be like, we're heading to the stars and we're taking these fuckers out. Yeah, as soon as like, I'll support you, I'll protect this place. But like, I'm not getting involved. This is like, not my job. <laughs> not my psychics, not my monkeys. I literally have to maintain the order and structure of this universe. I cannot get involved in this too. (laughs) (laughs) You do have a point in that. Something that I wanted to explore in this game was the impact of systems on individual people. And the fact that certain things are so ingrained that it perpetuates in the aspects of people's lives. Seeing people from outside all of that then enter into this world with its systems and how how they change in response to that. We're seeing what's at the very least an authentic expression, an authentic result of that interaction. That does resonate with me. Geyser, even though she's like supposed to be more evolved and stuff, has a very limited perspective outside of like the immediate here and now, depending on how overwhelming her emotions are. Siri necessarily takes a wide, wide view of everything. Your entire arc of the campaign has been, I need to find my place. And then you realize something about yourself that gives you a higher purpose and you are trying to maintain that so desperately that it is bigger than the other members of the party too. But for Geyser, Even though she can relate to the tiny weirdness of Smog based on her coming from an imaginary world 
she has always been, I need to deal with what I'm feeling now. I need to deal with what is happening now. My greater purpose is here. Not like she's thinking about her greater purpose. The most important thing is always in the room with you right now. The juxtaposition and that tension is series like this relationship between family is bigger than this one war. You don't have to kill people just because you're mad. And Geyser's like, this, I am fighting. (laughs) I will deal with the bigger picture when the bigger picture comes to me. And it's not going to come to Geyser because those that's the kind of thing that you have to seek out for yourself. She's not going to do that. <laughs> I try to have no correct answers, but just keep pushing on a conflict between either ideologies or methodologies or what have you. The player choices are what affects the results of that conflict. Of course, once Alpha is defeated, the governance sort of scrambles, having lost their general of sorts, and the conflict turns in the tides of the Marauders' favor. Everything starts to calm down a bit, and we all make towards the portal. Powder asks Aura to watch the ship, because she wants to come with us. And everybody heads into the portal. (laughs) <laughs> the portal. Isiri didn't get a chance to say no to Powder. Isiri didn't know that Powder was going to do that, did she? No, not at all. Yeah. As- Asira is probably already in the portal by the time Powder did that. And so we basically reached the end for all of this. I imagine that for a lot of you that there were a lot of alarms going on as I described <laughs> a room that had arcade cabinets rising. I was like, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> Yeah, we get a voice telling us that, hey, you did it, you're done. Clap, clap, end of the game, go home. (laughs) (laughs) We're not satisfied with that. We want to know where the fuck the missing people are. Smog tries to ask another version of himself, summoning him to see if there's a way. He's a snowboarder. Let's get past that. No, (laughs) I'm not moving past it. (laughs) Well, I want to jump right to a Siri having the solution of finding another way. (laughs) Uh, yet again, here I am at the end of a campaign with the move, if there's no door, I'll make one. And by God, do I make doors. <laughs> Assyria is not content with just giving up going home. There's too many unanswered questions. So she grabs everyone, forces her way past the machines, and we end up in a gray room with more arcade machines, but that's, like, reflected. And on the bottom is Terra and another, who is a figure of all white, and reflected on the top is a figure all black that is the other. And they're holding hands. We've talked about these forces before. One is trying to connect worlds as much as they can. The other is trying to keep worlds separate. And that is essentially what is asked of us. The decision that Terra thinks is theirs to decide here. But that the party still mulls over in detail. We continue hounding these entities with different questions that they give unsatisfying answers to that geyser has to prod at because they're misleading us do you want to talk about that move that you used i think like five times in the conversation (laughs) geyser has trust your gut that allows me to immediately ask a question on the deep dive list another and the other are trying to convince us one way or the other to choose to connect the words or to choose to keep them separate the reason why this was happening so often, especially for guys, is the fact that neither the other nor another were technically lying, but they were trying to manipulate all of you almost the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> A very different kind of conversations from the ones that we've had <laughs> previously. The, the thing that breaks my heart, and I knew that it was going to end this way, because I know yeah. how your brain works, Daniel, is what Tara says during all of this. Tara's grand machinations was, yes, to get back to Earth at the beginning, but somewhere along the way, this had turned into, I need to get back to Earth before the governance took everything, before every. So I need to make it right. I need to do the right thing to fix the home that was always meant for us so that we never ended up here. And I'm just like, babe, you're just 
becoming the governance. You know that, right? Like, <laughs> or I'm glad you push this a little bit. You are creating the circumstances by which the governance is cycling through time. You are creating the circumstance that allows the governance to go to Earth and fuck shit up. That's why all of the governance is humans and robots that humans have created. You're right. It would also explain why they are able to travel between worlds in a highly secretive manner. It's true. And definitely part of what I was thinking is that it could spiral into something that would lead to the initial instance of the governance's arrival on. We had never truly uncovered what the origin of the governance was. And part of that was intentional ambiguity, but also it, it allows something exactly like this to happen. One of the things that a Siri has been fixated on over the like at least since smog had the alexander moment for the first time but it's fixing a time loop there's a problem here that independent of smog's meddling there was always something a bit off something that felt like it was repeating and a theory thought these people never discovered mermaids even though there are shallow folk even though there are river folk why is that and she thought it was because of smog slash alexander's meddling which sure that's probably some part of it but also if this is the time loop, <laughs> if Terra is the time loop, I need to stop your ass from doing this again. It's something that connects all of our characters together, because I will say I'm not too sure how I fit Pony here, but Geyser is from quote unquote Earth, right? We've already explicitly connected Asiri and Terra's worlds through time and then we have alexander who's kind of not from that world but f partially from their time or like their parallel through time this specific loop of the governance somehow causes a disturbance on the characters worlds as well if geyser was a big picture person that could have been a moment where like you caused all of this suffering for <laughs> what if there was no magic during geyser's time and then like governance is like i want to be here too there's just a whole lot of things that could be really messy really fast <laughs> It all boils back to what we were looking for, the strange attractor, the Lorenz butterfly that we keep seeing. It's it's Terra. It's fucking Terra. <laughs> God damn it, 26 Bob. <laughs> it works so well narratively that I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, yes, this is cool. But also I'm like, Terra, I'm going to strangle you. A lot of this is also to explicitly harken back to the previous campaign. Terra in that game grew obsessed with Earth as a place that she felt she was meant to be. She became acutely aware of the wrongdoing that was going on to her people, to different planets and various star systems, to the point where it set her onto that. But by the end of that game, Terra was fully in a dark playbook <laughs> at that time. It was something that she developed a conviction to accomplish these things despite the great cost. It works great on the direction that Terra was set up. There's that twinge that it's through world travel. Terra promised Tony that she would come back, that, that she would find a connection back to there. Everything that Terra had learned in that whole experience was through world travel, these kind of solutions are possible in the first place. Both of those worked hand in hand to form Terra into what she became. If the words, you either die a hero or live long enough to become the villain, ain't true, I don't know what else is. <laughs> it's, so this is what's so funny to me, is that Terra, that turn, whatever was going on with them, no bearing in Smog's decision here. It's yeah. all about the, the argument that they were making, because, and I think what really hit Smog, especially Powder repeating it, is existence. Because I think that's something that everyone in the party has been fighting for and about smog comes from people who were made into material out of being kicked from a place that was more ethereal. Assyria is fighting for her people to continue living. Pony is fighting for her own existence. And we have these like pair of created beings and a deity. Who are you to say that they can't just be? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard, man. It's real hard. <laughs> Yeah, from everything that I have read from the other interstitial games, I learned that 
the choices between the other and another seem very straightforward. Or at least there was a general sense of agreement that there was an alignment with another. To accept that despite the messiness of connections between worlds, that it's it's ultimately for the best. I wanted to try to make that choice as hard as I could <laughs> in this case, because they both had been, because they did not exist per se, they were influencing indirectly the major events of of this game, or at least the, the background of it. Neither had a cut and dry, oh, they're obviously <laughs> the right person to go along with. Yeah, there's a reason in my games they showed up as the other being someone who you knew well, who is your best possible light link. It's to win you over with familiarity and cast out this seemingly brilliant idea of making connections with people as the most evil thing possible, your worst dark link. That's part of the ploy. It was always that force pushing forward. But I think we really see them both pushing in tandem here. I did heavily consider having their appearances also be of links that you all had from your home worlds, but part of me pushed against that for the sole reason that neither of them existed in this reality yet, and they had already been by proxy using people from mm -hmm. um, home worlds, or at least another had. The, the other had relied upon entities that were from the pub world's reality everything everything within its place maybe if they had been in existence at that time they would have appeared this this was before that had happened geyser if she was the type of person to think big brained would have chosen to close the worlds and i know i probably would have been an extreme minority <laughs> in the no i almost chose not to there's a couple reasons why i didn't but this is probably the closest I would have ever been to closing the connection. For Asteria, the big one is Powder. If Powder didn't exist at all, then it would have been a no-brainer. We don't want to do a His Dark Materials where they get on a coinciding bench every fucking year. We can't. <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> Even if this was to play out in a loop, and because Asiri and Terra have a back and forth here where like Asiri's like, how do you know what's best for humanity? You're just one person, and Terra retorts with, you just woke up to your cosmic powers a minute ago. Why do you think you know what's best? And the series is like, I don't. But I don't think you do either, because you're just some lady. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, even if it is a time loop, the Abyss is now aware of it. So the Abyss can grab Terra, the, the cosmic Schrodinger's cat, by the nape of the neck and pull her away from that. So the Abyss has gotten involved now. And the, I don't think once that floodgate has been opened, it's logical for her to turn back. A great point that the other tries to make is you could still try to gain passage your own way in the future. You just wouldn't be relying on our creation and configuration. But that's also almost a point against it because then, well, maybe the same exact things will happen. But the only difference is that someone who wants to exist does not. If we do close all this, do we remember? Do we even have the ability to go through this again? There's just too many unknowns. The other was definitely very explicit in trying to phrase that you, you could try to do this again. But did they even care if you could, if you could even manage to accomplish that? I think they would hope that you wouldn't. <laughs> Between like, you know, Assyria and Terra, it, Terra's argument was that Assyria was not human per se, which probably hurt Sirius' feelings <laughs> quite a bit uh, because of that attachment previously. Yeah, because the Syria had spent this time investing in Terra and Terra's abilities, and now Terra's just like, eh, you don't know what the hell you're talking about at the end here. The Syria's like, I can take all this away from you right now. <laughs> <laughs> he was not like that in the moment. Let's be fair. True. But also from Terra's point of view, she is currently trusted by pretty much every human on the planet to make decisions that affect all of their lives. Going forward, yes, Terra has this lock on people. But Smog has been sticking back and being on fucking TV and represents World Core, who has been yeah. doing just about everything they can to improve life on Sequence Charter specifically. And Terra represents an old guard. I wonder if there's not especially a big young contingent of people, especially on Sequence Charter, but maybe throughout all of Chrysalis, who are like, I want to hang out and see what World Core and the Mermaids do. Not for Geyser. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's what this 
boils down to. It's Terra's dream to go back to Earth. Nobody here, they're thousands of years removed from that life. Nobody knows Earth is literally a myth in the same way that the mountain of Mount Olympus is, like the existence of that is for us. It just doesn't make any sense in like a tangible way. Like sure, it exists. Like we know where it is in the, the star in the night sky, but we also know where Mars is. None of us know what Mars is like on like a personal level. There's so many fractures in this plan that of course we're gonna it, like seep in. Smog's gonna seep in with their fireside chat. Pony literally said fuck cops on national television. <laughs> <laughs> her was a challenge in that she was someone that I did not explicitly agree with in terms of what she became. In answer to your point, Sammy, there's plenty of people who still are spending millions to try to go to Mars, for example, even though they have no personal connection there. And Oh no, are you saying that Tara's Elon Musk? No! No! no. <laughs> cringe. Investing really heavily in AI, really wants to get to this other planet and think it's going to solve up. all the problems and none of the problems will exist on their planet Tara's they left anymore. Cancelled on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other aspect that Tara argued is, yes, they're thousands of years removed from Earth, but their logic is that they were unfairly removed from Earth. Terra didn't choose to go to a planet in a different star system. This this was a decision that their forebearers <laughs> had made when the governance had initially arrived, and this is potentially a way of skirting around it. This kind of explains why Smog still has a dark link with Terra upon coming back as Alexander Smog, now that I think about it. Yeah. Knowing this history. I mean- that's the beauty of it, right? Because it's a classic tragedy. Like, you can yeah. see the point of no return. It's it's a tragedy in that it's 100% preventable, but it's also doomed to happen every time the story plays out. And that's what makes it hurt so good. At least in Terra's logic, it was a parallel about what you all had been. You had been going to different worlds, seeing the conflicts going on in them, and then making changes that drastically transform those worlds in a way that you effectively seem suitable, right? Like, you replaced entire systems of how people operated in those worlds. You created a religion, or at least reestablished a religion in, in one of them. At least in Terra's logic, if that is allowable, then why not even a place that should be my home? But like, should be like the original home of humanity. Why not allow the exact same thing? It evokes the feelings of the last interstitial campaign I was in too. Yeah. We get to the end and it's just like the problems were the friends we made along the way the whole time. <laughs> I think what's like- really interesting about the difference between them is that you do just have the memories. You're separated except for one thing. There's one thing that keeps you wanting to come back for more. And that one thing fucking ruined Terra. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It made Paris's life. Like, she has a brother now. Yeah. It's such a different... The way they interpreted their experience and the piece that they got from it was completely different. It's funny. Even though Paris also did a murder, (laughs) Paris and Geyser are, are, like, way opposite end of spectrum characters like paris came with wisdom and perspective and a general tiredness of people's shit and then geyser is the shit that people are tired of (laughs) (laughs) geyser having nothing to say or do at the end is like right for the situation in the same way that paris leaving with someone that she believed was her family the whole time was right for her situation. We tried to find a middle ground. Like, Asiri and Tao were like, all right, well, let's make Uh, our own connection. Like, let's make our own corridors using the remnants of Tao's world and Asiri's willpower and all this. And Tara's like, no, you're just making a new configuration. It's not going to be stable. It's not right. And then finally, Asiri's like, all right, Powder, you're the unbiased one here. What the fuck do you want? That's where Smog is really won over. Like, yeah, they just want to exist. And that's that's really what harkens back to the older game, too. Like, the choice that every single player character made is, I want this version of me to exist. These memories deserve to exist. I'm not going to lose them just because they didn't 
happen in a physical space. And that's like a meta thing I wanted to, I, I think you're doing something different with these concepts because yeah. my approach for them was a very meta concept of like, why do we tell stories? Why do we play tabletop role playing games? Can you use these experiences? And because you took things into the physical world, you completely flipped the context of what was going on. Yeah. Was, I was telling Sammy too, that the events of if he literally have zero bearing on the other characters from the previous interstitial. Everyone else's experiences may have been completely different for Terra. It's something that we obviously couldn't know from the confines of within the story, but it could very well be that Terra's is the only instance where desire to travel back through worlds like took such a root that it led to this cascading effect in their home world, whereas everyone else... I wanted this to have that level of continuity, but I did want it to twist some things around. I'm pretty happy with how it resulted. Asuri asked Powder, what do you want? And Powder says, I trusted the captain. Now, mm, th there, there's a little doubt there, but... <laughs> Do you think that should another and other get what they wanted to leave us alone? They just care about existing, which of course affected Smog's opinion. But also like hearing the a series like, we're on a stalemate, so let's make a deal. We will go ahead and connect all these worlds so long as you don't do this shit ever again, because Tao's pissed about the kidnapping. I feel like everyone's yeah. pissed about the kidnapping, to be fair. We'll let you exist. That's fine. None of us have a problem with existence. In fact, a series whole stick is she loves existing. If you do this shit again, we're gonna come kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and you're gonna face the wrath of four and a half angry gods. <laughs> so <laughs> four and a half. They're like, all right, that's fine. Everyone agrees to it. And Tara's like, okay, you're letting me do what I want. But a series like if you go down the wrong path, I'm going to be the first one to clean up your act, and you will regret it. <laughs> so Tara <laughs> vows that she will do her best. <laughs> we did paraphrase a little bit. Powder did not explicitly say that she had stopped trusting the cap. There was uncertainty in this decision, though. Internally, she might feel that way, but that wasn't something she exactly expressed to you all, if that makes sense. Powder was talking about how she has always trusted the captain, but she's still very uncertain about decision. We make the deal. Tara vows we won't regret it. Yeah. She grabs another's hand and everything goes white as a world core flies out of her. That's game. Yeah. Sedge. Set and match. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be having a couple of scenes to say goodbye <laughs> to the characters in an epilogue format. See a little bit about consequences of how everything turned out. The Quincy's and the Remy's. I promise not to be like, oh, and you guys picked the evil ending. Because <laughs> no, that's like, <laughs> no, I got to twill my mustache. It's going to be largely written by evil. I'm just going to fill in. Our plan for now is to have one more normalish episode of a feat talking about the epilogues i think dan you wanted to be on yes and then probably someone oh, else yeah. and then we will probably do a video unedited after dark no uh oh, the adult parties. The adult parties. <laughs> version of the podcast and we'll let you know if that changes at all but that means that there'll be a normal episode and then a big overall campaign wrap up i'm gonna cry and then we'll get to turn my recommendations into march madness yeah <laughs> Because I'm going to start a bracket for you. It's going to be good. I don't think I had any regrets. There were a lot of things that I had set up in case they should happen that did not. For example, a possible conflict with the Marauders themselves, including Umbra, in the instance that they would try to stop you all following like the captain's orders or what have you. And then, of course, a confrontation at the very end between Terra and what would have been the rest of the captives who would have fought to connect the worlds if you all had sided with the other. Because the governance was the other's last line of defense, as it were. The captives plus terror were basically another. But I'm glad it turned out the way it was. So I don't think I have. Instead of toying around with figuring out what's going on with Juice's world core, I was considering having Smog speak more to Alrun about basically my epilogue plans. Yeah. It could have been interesting to explore. I'm happy with 
having explained why we're able to track down this portal and figure out that it was important to get in there. I don't know if this is a regret, but this is something I may have done differently. Somewhere in the deep goblin recesses of my gremlin little mind is the idea of attacking another and the other. I don't think Asira would do this, so I don't regret not doing it. But talk about making a third exit is just get rid of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think that would have went well, and I don't. I know for a fact that Siri wouldn't have done it unless they did something first. But it itches the corner of my mind, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it does feel like still participating in that binary choice, just in a more violent way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, not to comment too much on it, but that was one of the scenarios that I was expecting. In which case, the other would have been all for it. Because you get rid of us somehow, and the worlds aren't connected anymore. But another would have tried, and Terra themselves would have tried to stop that at all costs. The only thing for me that's a real regret is like the entire point that I talked to Dan about including Ruth in the campaign is because I wanted for the benefit of the party in the campaign setting to have more background on Geyser's actions. Why is this clown this way? You kind of <laughs> accepted Geyser as what she is, helped her redirect her chaotic energy and provided guidance and all that power of friendship and love and growth and all that great stuff. But I am a why person through and through. There is a reason for all of these actions and i wanted to demonstrate that and i think you all instead got a what <laughs> what is causing geyser's immense anger and clearly it's her past trauma <laughs> i think there was a why to explore all of the actions in the campaign all of geyser's hijinks wrapped up in a neat little bow to present to my friends and i just like but i don't know if i necessarily regret doing that because not only did it like feel cathartic in the moment like i hate you i personally hate ruth even though she's a character i invented <laughs> I imagined two parents for Jilly, Ruth and Ezra, but I don't really care about Ezra as much as a character because there's a through line of motherhood and like creation between Ruth and Jilly and Geyser. Ruth fucking hates the fact that Jilly exists. Like both of her parents hate Jilly, but Ruth hates Jilly because Ruth sees Jilly as defective and because Ezra also sees Jilly as defective Ezra blames Ruth for it this is a person that I created and I cannot stand and I'm blaming for all of my life's issues so much so that all of the magic energy and hatefulness that I'm like imbuing on my child creates another entire being right and so you have this other birth of Geyser herself from Jilly, who's being like horribly treated by her parents. But also, Geyser is really Jilly's mother figure. Ruth does a human job and has a human life and provides food and makes sure Jilly's existing, but barely at that. Like they barely acknowledge her existence. They leave windows to her room busted and broken and she's cold at night they are doing the bare minimum to keep her alive and geyser is the only one attending to her needs so not only is geyser the top child she's a mother and i think all of that is fun to think about and i just was like no <laughs> murder <laughs> You don't always get to know a character's tragic backstory. Yeah. Sometimes in a campaign session like this, it gets glossed over. You don't get the chance to get all those past hooks in. But in real life, too, like, y'all are my best friends, and y'all don't know half the terrible shit that's happened to me. Like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's not relevant sometimes. You just need to know that the emotion is there. Mm -hmm. We saw at least a tiny part of that, just in the subtext of how immediately Geyser chopped her arm off with a <laughs> yeah. chainsaw. Like, like all, all of that like emotional background was directed at, upon sight, just get rid of this person. Like, not mm -hmm. even for what they might be doing, but just for what you know that identity has done. Yeah. 
Smog was also the worst character to have as a scene partner to the effect that you were thinking about having, because would already know Geyser's backstory, doesn't have an interest in it, doesn't have an interest in talking to Ruth, just wants to see into the past to see what happened because he doesn't trust her. There's no motivation for Smog to be like, and now we'll witness this woman's epilogue. Yeah. <laughs> you needed a Siri there if you wanted to have a diplomatic discussion. <laughs> yeah. Siri would have tried to stop Geyser from, yeah. yes. <laughs> from hacking at her. <laughs> Let's get into the resolution phase, the segment of the show where we each get to say something about the game with no responses. What is your final say on this session, Daniel, our beloved GM? And so the connections were made and the worlds are linked forevermore. I don't have any social media, so you can find me in the worlds between worlds. I promise that I'm not going to do unscrupulous things. What about you, Dee? Geyser loves you. Or not. You'll have to ask her, but don't look too edible. You can find me on Twitter or Blue Sky as Backslider D. I'm on Instagram as I had a cow lol. That's also my PSN name. We can exchange friend codes to game together on Switch. I have been playing Yu Gi Oh! Master Duel <laughs> obsessively. Obsessively. I want you to play it too so that I can talk nerd shit with you. But don't play the Mikanko deck because it's ass and I will beat you. <laughs> and for you, Alex. You may say goodbye, but I say hello. You can find me on Blue Sky at Shining Crobat. This week I recommend Chicory. It is a video game where you play as a dog who inherits a magic paintbrush. You use this to move around the world kind of like in Splatoon, where you sink down into the ink that you've plastered all over the screen. The story is about creating art, receiving inspiration from contemporaries, and how sometimes the people who are supposed to guide us can fail us. I think it has a little something to do with our finale here, maybe. Uh, you can play at co-op. Zach and I had a lovely time playing this co-op. One person can color in the screen, while the other person controls the dog you get to name. And for myself, love is a very powerful force. You just have to know how to keep it in check because it, it can be what saves you and it can be what ruins you. But it's okay. The Abyss is watching. You can find me curled on the floor crying in a puddle of my own tears. The game's over, guys. I'm real sad. I don't, I don't want it to end. <laughs> but I'll keep going. <laughs> This has been Resolve, an after play show. You can find us online at most social media sites at Resolve AP. Except Instagram, which is at Resolve After Play. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. You can buy the game we're playing, Interstitial, Our Hearts Intertwined, from its creator, Riley Hopkins, at linksmithgames.com. All links will be included in the episode description. Thank you so much for listening. We end our turn here, so now it's your turn. Tell us what's happening in your game. <laughs>